The scrotum. Uh, this is another one of those regions of the body where the anatomy, I think, is particularly interesting, but it doesn't get talked about a lot because, well, it's the scrotum. Um, there is, okay, well, inside the scrotum are the testes. And the testes are involved in reproduction, which means there are some strong evolutionary drivers of the anatomy here to maximize the efficiency of reproduction. Uh, so one of the main jobs of the scrotum is to the, well, temperature management of the testes, which is important for spermatogenesis, so to bring the testes closer to or further away from the body. Anyway, the scrotum is made up of a lot of layers. It gets very confusing. Why is it made of so many layers and does this cause any problems? Yes, it does. We'll look at all of that. The trick with the scrotum is the abdomen. Um, so the testes, or both sets of gonads, ovaries and testes, they start to form in the posterior abdominal wall back there, right? And they descend to their final location. The ovaries stay in the pelvis, the testes go a little bit further and they end up all the way out here. Which means that the testes have to pass through the abdominal wall. And the abdominal wall is made up of a number of layers of skin and muscle and fascia and peritoneum. Now, if you start from that point, the layers of the scrotum make sense. So what have we got here in the abdominal wall? Where if we start from the outside and go in, we've got skin and then we've got some subcutaneous fat and superficial fascia. Then we have three layers of muscle, external oblique, internal oblique, transversus abdominis. And then running around here, deep to those muscles, we have the transversalis fascia. And then deep to that, we have the, the peritoneum. So if the uh, scrotum is gonna push out through all of that, let's bear those layers in mind when we look at the anatomy of the scrotum. So with the anatomy of the scrotum, let's start from deep to superficial. So we'll start with the peritoneum. Now the testis itself, um, what we can really see here is we can see the tunica albuginea. Tunic refers to the coat. Albuginea uh, means white, Al like the egg white is albumin, right? So the white coat of the testis is the tunica albuginea, and that's the connective tissue that's giving it that oval shape and giving the testis structure. So that's testis. Now the next layer, um, so the reason I keep grabbing uh, cling film is because this is representing a serous membrane. So inside the abdominal cavity, there is peritoneum. That's this serous membrane. And the peritoneum lines the inside of the abdominal cavity and it goes over the viscera. So we have a uh, parietal peritoneum lining the walls and a visceral peritoneum covering the viscera. And there's a little bit of fluid in between those two layers that lets everything move nice and easily. And we see the same thing with the lungs, the pleura. And we see the same thing with the heart, the pericardium, and we see the same thing in the scrotum. Now, what really happens here, it isn't that the, the testes push out through the peritoneum. It's a little bit more than that, but um, the peritoneum does get pulled out with the testes into the scrotum. And the layer so the first layer of the scrotum, the deepest layer of the scrotum, the layer that's next to the tunica albuginea of the testis is the tunica vaginalis. Seems to be a bit of a confusing word when we're talking about the male reproductive system. Um, so vagina means like an exvagination or an invagination. So if you have peritoneum um, lining the abdominal wall and something pokes into it, you now have an exvagination Right, now if you make a coat from that exvagination, and you're gonna call this the tunica vaginalis, and like the peritoneum and the pleura and the pericardium, it's gonna form a double fold. So we have two layers of tunica vaginalis. One layer is next to the, the organ, the visceral layer. This layer, which is gonna be up against the next layer of the scrotum, 
it's going to be up against the wall of the scrotum parietal refers to wall. This is the parietal layer of the tunica vaginalis. Um, so then just like the peritoneum and the pleura, we've got two layers of serous membrane with a potential space in between with a little bit of fluid there. And what that means is that the testis can move around freely within the scrotum. And that's what we find. However, that movement is limited because this is going to be difficult to explain, but the testis is attached to the, the visceral layer of the tunica vaginalis, right? And then there's got to be a fold, This because this is a single continuous layer, that's got to fold back at some point to make the parietal layer of the tunica vaginalis, which is then attached to the next layer, and the testis can then swing around because there's a potential space and a little bit of fluid between those two layers, right? But because you've got that fold around here, which is actually probably going to be posteriorly, that means how much the testis can actually rotate is going to be limited because of the fold of that pleural, of that, um, of that serous membrane. Does that make sense? And of course, the reason I'm doing this is because the testis is still attached to everything inside the abdomen. So it's blood vessels, it's nerves, the vas deferens, they're passing up here and through the abdominal wall. So at some point, you're going to have that configuration there. So tunica vaginalis is made up of two layers of this thin serous membrane. The visceral layer attaches to the testis and then folds back to make the parietal layer, which is attached to the next scrotal layer, which we'll talk about in a moment. There's a potential space, a little bit of fluid in between, which means the testis, testis can move around freely, but it's limited as to how far it can actually move around because of this fold and this attachment. There is also a little bit of an anchor down here. The gubernaculum is the name of the structure that guides the descent of the testis, and there's a remnant of the gubernaculum inferiorly which ties it down. But anyway, tunica vaginalis, the most complex bit of this whole thing. Just to add a bit more fun to that, um, if the posterior abdominal wall is covered by peritoneum, the testes actually start to form in the retroperitoneal area and they descend through the abdomen retroperitoneally and then kind of take a fold of peritoneum, a double fold of peritoneum with them when they go down to the scrotum. Anyway, that's more more confusing. The name of the of the um, the exvagination of peritoneum when that's all happening is called the processus vaginalis. Um, so as this goes out through the abdominal wall, there's like a a process of peritoneum because that's going to come back later. The next layer, so we've got the tunica albuginea, and then we have two layers of tunica vaginalis, which lets the testis swing around. And then we have the internal spermatic fascia. So that's what the, that fascia, so fascia is a connective tissue sheet, right? It's quite tough. It's not very stretchy. It's a good structural layer. Um, that parietal layer of, tra of uh, tunica vaginalis is attached to that internal spermatic fascia layer. The internal spermatic fascia layer corresponds to the um, transversalis fascia. So in the abdomen you have the peritoneum, then you have the transversalis fascia. That's what we're seeing down here as well. And then you have uh, the chromaster muscle. So this is what we see here. So we have like that, you might see chromaster fascia, chromaster muscle. So this muscle here essentially corresponds to the internal oblique muscle layer. And you can see how so this is the spermatic cord here. You can see how the spermatic, uh, you can see how the chromaster muscle extends all the way up there. Um, so the chromaster muscle is a uh, striated muscle, a somatic muscle. There's a little bit of debate about that. Recent evidence, I think, is pointing towards some smooth muscle here, some autonomic stuff going on. But it doesn't really matter. Um, this is innervated by the genitofemoral nerve, the genital branch of the genitofemoral nerve. And it causes, you can see from 
the way the muscle fibers are oriented, the chromaster muscle pulls the testis closer to the body when it needs to increase in temperature. Uh, and that muscle relaxes and the testis can fall away from the body when the temperature needs to drop. So there's the chromaster muscle layer. And then the next layer is another layer of fascia, which is the external spermatic fascia. So that would be up, superficial to that, upon that. The external spermatic fascia is equivalent to the external oblique muscle. And then on top of that, the, um, the subcutaneous tissue of the skin, the subcutaneous fascia here, um, covers the external spermatic fascia. And that subcutaneous fascia in the testis has developed some smooth muscle. And this is the datos muscle. We can't see that there, but if we had some skin, it's the, it's the layer just deep to the skin. And the datos muscle, um, this smooth muscle attaches to the skin, and that's what causes the wrinkling of the, the scrotum. So the datos muscle being smooth muscle is under autonomic innovation. So this is under autonomic control. Um, and again, it's to do with management of, of, of temperature. So if you have more surface area, you can lose more heat, so you can cool the tissue. If you have less surface area, uh, you lose less heat, so you maintain warmth. So the datos muscle affects the surface area of the scrotum. So again, managing the temperature regulation of the testes, very cool. And then on top of the datos muscle, the next layer, the next superficial layer is the last layer, it's the skin. Now the skin covering the scrotum, um, there are some nerves that will innervate the anterior scrotum. So there are anterior scrotal nerves and posterior scrotal nerves. But here we have the ilioinguinal nerve, which comes from L1 and L2 spinal levels and curves around like that. And that will generally carry sensory innervation back from the anterior scrotum. Whereas down here and underneath in the perineum, uh, so the major nerve that's innervating the penis and the perineum is the pudendal nerve and the pudendal nerve will innervate the skin of the posterior scrotum. The posterior femoral cutaneous nerve was probably going to get involved as well. But So with the scrotum it's interesting to have those ideas of nerves coming from two different directions, pudendal posteriorly, ilioinguinal anteriorly. Because, you know, if you, well, I mean, if you needed to anaesthetize the scrotum, you're gonna do it locally. But you know what I mean, it's, it's interesting anatomy. Uh, the blood supply then follows that as well because there, so the femoral artery is gonna give off a deep external pudendal artery, which is gonna supply blood to the scrotum. But the, pudet, the um, internal pudendal artery, which is coming out of the pelvis and is supplying blood to most of the perineum and the penis, the internal pudendal artery is also going to supply blood to the scrotum. The veins will generally match the artery, arterial supply. We can see some lymph nodes here. So these um, superficial inguinal lymph nodes, these are draining lymph from the scrotum. So the important idea here, which we always talk about in teaching, is that the scrotum, those layers that I've been talking about, the skin, the fascia, those muscles, they are going to drain lymph to these superficial inguinal lymph nodes, which will then go to deep inguinal lymph nodes and then back into the pelvis and abdomen. So, for example, if a, a cancer formed in the scrotum, you might expect those cells to travel to these lymph nodes around here, whereas, of course, the testes formed in the abdomen descended to this position and they trail their blood vessels and their lymphatic vessels and their innervation along that pathway. So testicular cancer doesn't typically spread to these nearby inguinal lymph nodes. Testicular cancer spreads to the, uh, the paraaortic lymph nodes, the lymph nodes up there in the abdomen, which is uh, dangerous, right? Because you can't palpate those guys, but you can palpate these guys. So scrotum versus testis, it's a really, really important bit of anatomy. Um, which is why we harp on about the embryology so much. Does the anatomy of the scrotum cause any problems? <laughs> yes, of course it does. Um, so that tunica, that tunica vaginalis is a big problem. Um, also, it's lovely to have your testes swinging around in your scrotum. Um, because you've got this uh, double layered serous membrane with that potential space inside, more fluid can develop 
in that space than normal for whatever reason. There are lots of reasons why more fluid might develop in that space between the layers of the tunica vaginalis. Could be inflammation, could be uh, they're stimulated to make too much fluid or there's a blockage of fluid being removed. But for whatever reason, fluid accumulates in the space between the layers of the tunica vaginalis and the testis becomes larger. This is a worry. Or the scrotum becomes larger, really. Um, if the swelling is a little, then you might still be able to palpate the testis. If the swelling, if the amount of fluid that collects is a lot, then you might not be able to palpate the testis anymore. This is usually painless, but is concerning. Um, shine a light through it, transillumination. If you shine a light through the scrotum and that light passes through the scrotum, it's passing through the fluid of that hydrocele testis. Now, if the light doesn't pass through, then you've got a solid mass, so maybe you've got a testicular tumour uh, in that case. But with uh, hydrocele testis, you should be able to transilluminate it. The light should pass through the fluid, right? Also, um, testicular torsion. I said that the, the testes are attached to everything else through this this structure here. So here you've got the blood vessels and the nerves and what have you. And I said that um, because of the normal structure of the tunica vaginalis, the, um, the testis can swing around a little bit inside the scrotum, but not too far because of the way this is structured. If if that folding between the two layers hasn't occurred normally and is actually much higher up the spermatic cord and the testis can swing more freely than it should, it might rotate all the way around. And then the structures in the spermatic cord there might get twisted. The veins will become twisted and closed. The arteries will become twisted and closed. The blood supply to the testis is off which will cause ischemia, cell death, lots of pain, nausea, vomiting. Usually the pain presents on one side and this is testicular torsion. It's more common with something that gets called uh, the bell clapper deformity and that's describing that alternative organization of the uh, tunica vaginalis layer in that the fold is up here rather than down at the level of the testis. So the testis can swing too freely, testicular torsion. And then also um, that processus vaginalis um, that forms as the testis passes through the abdominal wall layers and down to the scrotum during development, that processus vaginalis is supposed to disappear. It's supposed to not exist in the adult. And that deep inguinal ring, so the inguinal canal is what this stuff is all passing through. The inguinal canal is the canal in the abdominal wall. That deep inguinal ring is supposed to be nice and small and tight and closes when you increase your abdominal pressure and stops your small bowel from going out through the inguinal canal. But if the processus vaginalis doesn't disappear and remains intact and continues to pass through the deep inguinal ring, that means that that person is more likely to suffer an indirect inguinal hernia. That is a loop of small bowel or something else will pass into the deep inguinal ring through the inguinal canal, uh, causing a, an inguinal hernia up here and maybe and may continue on um, out through the superficial inguinal ring and into the scrotum. So yes, uh, scrotum anatomy is important. It is interesting. It does describe uh, some of the reasons why some of these problems occur down here. But there you go, the anatomy of the scrotum. All right, see you next week. <laughs>